I started this book uh, a while ago, A World Lit Only by Fire by William Manchester. And this book came to my attention because it, uh, uh, some people had been talking about it, it had been cited a few different places. And I thought, well, uh, I saw it in a used bookstore and I thought uh, I'll get it and take a look at it. From the first page, I suddenly realized that this isn't just a straightforward history. This is a referendum on the Middle Ages. This is a good author, William Manchester, a very accomplished biographer, actually. Um, but he really attacks the Middle Ages in terms of a time period, in terms of a culture, in terms of its civilization, in ways that sort of come off to me as uh, unfair. And I think it's important to discuss why it is sort of unfair and then um, talk about context, talk about uh, the anthropology a little bit of the Middle Ages. So from the first page, I noticed that, that something was, was different about this. He's talking about the Middle, Age, uh, the Middle Ages. Very little is clear about that dim era. In intellectual life had vanished from Europe. And further down, after the extent fragments have been fitted together, the portrait which emerges is a melange of incessant warfare, corruption, lawlessness, obsession with strange myths, and an almost impenetrable mindlessness. <laughs> so it was one of these books where I, f I first started, in the first chapter I'm thinking, do I really want to go further with this? Uh, this really sort of seems unfair. And he says, it says much about the Middle Ages that in the year 1500, after a thousand years of neglect, the roads built by the Romans were still the best on the continent. There's some points in this where I thought, did he really say that? In the medieval mind, there was no awareness of time, which is even more difficult to grasp. In all Christendom, there was no such thing as a watch, a clock, or apart from a copy of the Eastern tables in the nearest church or monastery, anything resembling a, cal a calendar. Really, it's really harsh um, on the Middle Ages, and uh, as I was going forward, I sort of was sort of caught up in um, uh, the condemnation that William Manchester has for essentially a whole continent, a whole time period, um, whole whole, whole cultures, uh, you know, from Spain to Russia um, over this thousand-year period. It's called the Middle Ages. And I decided to continue with it. And I decided to continue with it because it's important to read books that you disagree with. And the reason it's important to read books that you disagree with is because when you realize that you disagree with something, that's when you really understand what it is that you believe. Uh, and when you come across a book that makes you makes you think is that really true uh, it then forces you to muster up your own knowledge formulate your own uh, concepts and postulate your own thesis as to why what this author is saying is incorrect so it's very important every once in a while to read a book that has an alternative viewpoint that really makes you question is you know or what is what you believe or what you understand about in this case history is it true now as the book goes on um, and we progress to the renaissance period he he gets at something uh, that he didn't get at in the medieval period and that is nuance so the big names of the renaissance appear so in the late 1400s early 1500s and that's really where the book um, comes into its own. He, once you get into the Renaissance, he does start to get to individuals. And that's where Manchester, as a biographer, you start to see his, uh, his background come out. Uh, and the book does improve about halfway through, where he gets starts talking about the big names of the Renaissance. So Erasmus, Luther, Henry VIII, uh, Magellan. Magellan sort of becomes the capstone um, of this book. So there is a, a really neat map in this book. Um, 
there's uh, 16th century distances, and it shows, like, for instance, how long it would take to get from Venice to Constantinople. And that's just, that is a neat thing that Manchester includes. One of the main points that he makes when he's discussing the Renaissance is that the humanists, the people who were uh, doing the classical learning, the Greek and the Latin, um, if, if you were in a Catholic country, you were probably in danger as a humanist, and if you were in a Protestant country, you are probably in danger because the humanists weren't going along with the Protestant-Catholic divide, necessarily, that there were uh, humanists that were just thinking differently than the rest of the society, and that put them in jeopardy whether or not they were in a Protestant country and a Catholic country. And that's probably uh, very accurate, that um, if you weren't going along with the king's program, with the official religion in the whichever country you're living in, in the 16th century, um, you could probably get into a lot of trouble. An important thing about Manchester's discussion about the Middle Ages, and really his his quite uh, demanding critique of it, is he says it just doesn't hold up to the, the classical antiquity that preceded it. And this is a very common argument. And William Manchester, as an established scholar, sort of codifies a lot of the, uh, the critiques that people have of the Middle Ages. Um, that classical Greece, basically in a nutshell, classical Greece and Rome were very sophisticated, very advanced civilizations, and then everything got set back during the Middle Ages. And you just sort of wait for the Renaissance to happen and uh, for civilization to start again. And the truth is that that's just really not true. So one of the concrete examples that he gives is that uh, basically it's a, it's a testament to how terrible the Middle Ages were because after a thousand years, the best roads were still the roads that the Romans had built. Well, it's hard to compete with the Romans when it comes to roads, and that's anywhere in the world. So there are fantastic civilizations all over the world that never had the, the roads that the Romans had. Um, in the United States, for instance, we didn't have an interstate highway system until the 1950s. And if you were in the United States in the 19th century, most of the, the roads were just dirt, dirt paths. Um, you want to be suspicious when somebody starts talking about a whole society, a whole culture, a whole continent, uh, or a whole time period, and all they're talking about is horrible and terrible it was. So most people who ever lived before the Industrial Revolution were doing what people had done for centuries and centuries and centuries, whether they were Romans, Greeks, Chinese, uh, Aztecs, Mayans, uh, they lived in Carolingian times during Charlemagne, they lived in Anglo-Saxon England, most people were farmers. And the things that the ruling class would do were actually oftentimes very distant. A lot of people wouldn't even know what the emperor or the king even looked like because those things were done far away and their, their whole lives were working a plot of land. So uh, the Middle Ages actually have a lot more in common with the Roman times than you'd think. And the big one is that in both eras, probably about 90% of the people spent their whole lives living and working out in the countryside. What he doesn't talk about are the engineering marvels of the Middle Ages including the castles and the cathedrals, the windmills and the water mills. So for instance, somebody had to engineer the cathedrals. Those 12th and 13th century cathedrals are just marvelous. Somebody had to design those and build those. They had to have artisans. There were incredible social advancements in the Middle Ages. In classical Greece and Rome, these were mostly slave societies. Half the population in the Roman Empire, at least, was slave. However, in the Middle Ages, you go from people in the countryside being slaves to being tenants. And by today's standard, being a tenant farmer would be pretty terrible. Um, you, you, you had to work land that you didn't really own, and you had to pay all these taxes uh, to the Lord. Uh, however, 
being a tenant farmer is an improvement over being a slave. So that was a big social improvement going from, you know, workers are slaves to workers are tenants. Women in the Middle Ages had a new option that they didn't have during classical civilization. There are many women in the Middle Ages, like Julian of Norwich um, and Hildegard von Bingen, who became great scholars and they could um, contribute to the intellectual life of the society. Literacy advanced tremendously during the Middle Ages, believe it or not. So literacy in antiquity was really sort of limited to the Mediterranean sphere, the Greek and Roman sphere, and then in the Middle Ages because of in the West, the Catholic Church, and in the East, the Eastern Orthodox Church, when Christianity spread to a new population, it also came with the alphabet. So in the West, you got the Roman alphabet in uh, Western Europe, and then in Eastern Europe, Saint Cyril, who spread Christianity to parts of uh, Eastern Europe, Saint Cyril brought what became the Cyrillic alphabet. In the Middle Ages, uh, entire societies and cultures that we'd never heard about in antiquity, Central Europe, Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, that we only had understood through the lens of the Greeks and the Romans, we now hear firsthand, for the first time in all of history, we now hear from the people that live up in Norway, we now hear from the people in Russia. We now hear their own story from their, from their own perspective because they have gained something that they never had before, and that is people in their society, a small portion, however, enough people in their society have the ability to record things and tabulate things and tell their own stories that we get things like the Viking Eddas. So we get the Viking mythology. Manchester spends a lot of time talking about how it was, important it was during the Renaissance for these explorers to go out and, and find new parts of the world. However, in the Middle Ages, the greatest navigators maybe in the world were the Norsemen. The Norsemen made it all the way to North America. They made it to Canada. There were uh, Norwegians living in Greenland and in Iceland because they had gone to places that no Greek or Roman even knew existed. The Middle Ages had uh, the development of the three crop rotation uh, cycle that greatly improved the amount of food that was available. And even though it wasn't always practiced because people are people, at least the idea of moral virtue is added to the warrior code in the Middle Ages. So Lancelot, for instance, um, is the model warrior. And you could say that he's a great improvement because he is out to protect, uh, the, he's out to protect the weak and those who can't protect themselves. So even though those, that, you know, that's from literature and that wasn't necessarily how people uh, lived and practiced, at least the idea the idea that strong men are supposed to be protecting those who can't protect themselves really becomes comes into vogue in the Middle Ages. A very important political development happens in the English-speaking world, and that is the Magna Carta. And, that, and you start to see the limits on what powerful people can do. It wasn't all corrupt in the Middle Ages uh, with the church. You had wonderful figures like St. Patrick, um, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Clair. There are all kinds of uh, people that actually did live uh, the spiritual life and, uh, and all these centuries later they are still uh, held in high regard. So some other books about the Middle Ages. This is Life in Medieval Times by Marjorie Rowling. This is Augustine by Robin Lane Fox about the life of the saint. And this is a well-illustrated uh, book on social history, daily life in the middle in medieval times by Francis and Joseph Guise. So I encourage you to read A World Lit Only by Fire by William Manchester and also engage with books that challenge you, make you think about things in different ways and force you to muster up your own knowledge base
to wonder, is what this author is saying really true?